Well, thank you. Uh, you know, Mark, uh, Mark Murray's been a good friend for a long time. Uh, we've known each other for almost 25 years. He was the state treasurer under John Engler. And I was the deputy county executive for Ed McNamara at the time was the major Democrat in this state. And Engler and McNamara would fight terribly. Uh, but when they finally decided it was time to resolve things, they call us and Mark and I would go in a room together and we'd work it out. Uh, and we became very good friends uh, in that process. But you know, you look at his life, what he's done for Grand Valley and what he's done at Byers, but you say, never did we imagine 25 years ago that he would be one of the major employers in the city of Detroit, and even less likely that I'd be the mayor. But you never know how life's going to turn out. Uh, how many of you were here when I did the uh, presentation a year ago? And you came back. I guess I'm glad it's raining outside and you're, uh, uh, you're in here. But I'm going to update from what we did uh, a year ago. Uh, and so the question really is, uh, from when we stood here, what's changed? So let me start with something first that stayed the same. And that is my relationship with the Detroit City Council. Remember, people a year ago said, ah, they're just united in their, their opposition to uh, Kevin Orr. And as soon as he's gone, it'll be business as usual. But what you have seen in the last year is that the partnership has continued. We have as fine a city council uh, as we've had in the city in a great many years. Uh, they are partners in everything I'm going to show you. And I just take a moment to ask Brenda Jones and the city council members to please stand up. So this is a really interesting thing. Over the years, you'd have only a couple of city council members show at the chamber conference, the us versus them politics and attacking the business community. For the first time this year, all nine members of the Detroit City Council are attending this conference. Uh, it's a different day. And I tell you, above all else, it's a tribute to Sandy Barua and the leadership of the chamber, because this chamber has been actively involved in the welfare of the city of Detroit, and the fact that all of us are here uh, is because of the job he's doing. And Sandy, thank you uh, for all that you've done for our community. So what else has changed? Uh, first thing that's changed is streetlights, uh, and probably the most visible thing. Uh, but when I started in January last year, uh, uh, nearly half of all the lights in the city were out. And when I stood here a year ago, we had managed to install 7,000, which was pretty, I thought, good. The yellow sections are uh, the sections where uh, the lighting was done, the green we were working on a year ago, and the dark blue we hadn't gotten to. And then last week, we installed our 44,000th light. I'm going to get out of the lights here. Uh, we installed our 44,000th light. Uh, and the green is where we're going, and by the end of July, every neighborhood light in this city will be done. So, so what you've got is that in neighborhood after neighborhood, this now looks like that. And our main roads are being lit to a standard that you're going to be able to read a magazine at night. We are making some progress. EMS, we all remember the stories a year and a half ago about people waiting an hour for an ambulance. They were true. They were some tragedies. And so uh, when I started, we only had 13 ambulances. We basically ran them around the clock. Uh, and it was an 18-minute response time, the worst in the country. When I stood here a year ago, I said, we got 17 ambulances on the street. We got it down to 14 minutes. And now we're down to 10 minutes. We're starting to approach the national average. And the good thing is, if you look in the last year, we've hired 100 new EMTs, and we've got 38 working ambulances, which means we can maintain the vehicles while the others are on the road. Uh, you aren't seeing those stories about people calling 911 and having no response. Uh, Blight, uh, everybody remembers what Dan Gilbert and the Blight Task Force did, and their advice question was, could we deliver? And you remember I stood here a year ago and I showed you the Mary Grove, the neighborhood where we went around and took the pictures. That was our first week of filing lawsuits. So how have things gone? 
Uh, well, let me start with the vacant lots. When I stood here a year ago, 100,000 vacant lots in Detroit hadn't been cut in four years. Now, being cut twice a summer. City looks better. <laughs> trash all over the city. We put out new DPW crews, six of them picking up 600 tra tons of trash a week. Neighborhood after neighborhood, day by day. This is now looking like this. And this now looks like this. And this now looks like this. This is what's happening in the city every day. We're cleaning up the dump sites. The abandoned houses. I'm a great believer that we can save thousands and thousands of houses in the city. I'm going to show you that we're doing it. But in order to save the good houses, you got to clean the burned out houses out. And so we are demolishing at amazing speeds. But we set priorities. The green there, the federal government provided us with the support of Governor Schneider, $100 million, but they said you got to demolish in targeted areas. We thought that made sense. Let's set our priorities. And so we took neighborhoods where basically the houses are 80% occupied, that you can drive down the street and at least four out of five houses are occupied. And those are the sections shaded in green. That's where we're targeting our efforts. Last year, we took out 4,000 abandoned homes. Every one of those blue dots that was taken down was a house that wasn't salvageable. And this year, we're going to have another 4,000. And the purple are the ones we're taking. And all of those green areas you see, those are solid neighborhoods with good houses. By taking the abandoned houses in the surrounding areas, we're raising the property values of the good neighborhoods. And Anybody here heard somebody in the media say downtown and midtown are doing great? What are they doing in the neighborhoods? Okay, that's typically somebody in the media who lives in the suburbs, but we're going to educate <laughs> in the course of this day what everybody in Detroit knows, which is what's actually going on in the neighborhood, so I'm going to show you. We file 75 lawsuits every single week against owners of abandoned homes. And if you can see those dotted lines, those are zones where we sued on every single abandoned house in that particular area. And so here's what we do. We go in and we'll file suit on every abandoned house in the neighborhood the same day on a nuisance theory. I told you a year ago we we're going to do this, and I'm going to show you what happened. Every owner is given two choices. Your property is held to be a nuisance to your neighbors. You cannot maintain it that way. You can either sign a court order to get it fixed up and occupied in six months, which is what I want. I don't want the house. But if you aren't going to do that, you can lose the property of the land bank, and we'll take it, and we'll sell it on the internet like eBay. We're now filing 50 to 75 cases every single week, rolling across the neighborhoods in this city. And then, you remember last year? I said I'm going to auction these on the website. You can check it out, buildingdetroit.org. Who's going to buy a vacant house in Detroit? You've got to be out of your mind. What's he talking about on this website? Last year, we were auctioning one house a day. We started the week before I got up here. We're now up to auctioning three houses a day. And here's how it works. We started in Marygrove, what I showed you a year ago. We put this poster on all 120 vacant houses. And we said, you're going to be sued. Uh, and this is the product of Dan Gilbert and the Blight Task Force. Every red rectangle there was a vacant house. Under the original blight assumptions, all 120 of those vacant houses were going to have to be demolished because nobody would want all those vacant houses, right? That was the assumption. So one year ago today, we thought 120 vacant houses in Marigold were going to have to be demolished. Here's where we are now. These are the maps that we operate off of. And green on these maps means we've resolved it. If it's got an X, we demolished it. If it's got a, a yellow, the land bank owns it. The ones with the hatch marks, they sign consent agreements. And so every week in every neighborhood, we have maps on the wall. They go from red to green, red where they're vacant, uh, and nobody's been able to do anything, to green where we're addressing them. 90 of those 120 houses are going to be saved. 90 families are going to move into houses we thought were going to be demolished. And we've already sold 33. So uh, we sold this house on Wisconsin that nobody thought anybody wanted for $8,000. So that's a good day. And then we sold this house for, on Rose Lawn for $11,000. And then we sold this house on Ohio in a neighborhood everybody walked away from. These houses have been vacant for four years before we sold them for $30,000. Last Thursday, we sold three houses in one day. Okay, There hadn't been three houses sold in this neighborhood in three years. 
We sold three in one day, and they're typically going between five and ten thousand dollars. People are buying for five thousand and putting thirty thousand into them, and they're rebuilding the neighborhoods. Boston Edison, if you're familiar with Detroit, beautiful area. Henry Ford once lived there. Barry Gordy once lived there. Joe Lewis once lived there. 149 vacant houses when I stood here a year ago. 149 demolitions coming. I didn't believe it. So we went and we started suing. And we took the title. I'm just going to show you what happened last weekend. This last weekend, on Friday, we sold this vacant house on Edison for $80,100. It was going to get knocked down. Crazy, right? And then, on Sunday, we sold this house on Boston for $130,000. And on Monday, yeah, we, we, the auction was held on Memorial Day. We didn't care. We sold three houses on Memorial Day. We go every day. <laughs> this house on Chicago went for $100,000. These were neighborhoods people had given up on. Look how beautiful these houses are. And of the 149 vacant houses, we resolved 100 of them, only one house in the Boston Edison neighborhood is going to have to be demolished. This is the progress that we are making. So how much have we actually done? We started the suits in May. We have filed 1,900 lawsuits against owners of abandoned houses. 468 have signed consent agreements. They're fixing up the house without us doing anything. Of course, that's what I want, because when they see all the other houses being fixed up, they say, my house has value. I can fix it up and sell it. We've taken title to 400, we've sold 320, and in our 1,900 lawsuits, we have not lost a single case. Not one time has a judge said, yeah, the house is abandoned, it's a nuisance to your neighbors, but it's okay. Uh, that's not happening. So what does it look like, these hundreds of houses? I love hanging out in these neighborhoods. So here's the very first house on Mary Grove that signed a consent agreement, and there's how it looks today. This house on Vaughn, is how it looked when we sued on it, and here's how it looks today. This house on Bentler looked like this about eight months ago, and here's how it looks today. I spend every day driving neighborhoods. I drive the staff nuts, but this is, I love this. <laughs> hey, this house on Ohio, here's how it looks today. You want to see what the inside of some of these look like? Okay, there was the inside of the Ohio house when we sued on it, and here is that same room today. That's right. Here's the bedroom in Ohio, and here's the bedroom today. We are turning these vacant houses into homes for family. This house in Woodbridge now looks like that. <laughs> eh? I don't, I, apparently it's from the Up movie. Maybe somebody here knows what that means, <laughs> but we got some kind of kids movie fan who duplicated the house. And this house on Longfellow, Looks like this. You want to see a beautiful Boston Edison house inside? Here's how it looked when we filed the lawsuit. Here's how it looks today. This is what we are doing hundreds of times. And this is how it looks today. We're making some progress. So I do get a little irritated when somebody says, what are they doing in the neighborhoods? I say, come drive with me. I'll show you. Uh, it's hard to miss the progress that's being made. And here's the thing I've said over and over. I want to be judged on one standard. Is the population of the city of Detroit going up or going down? We went from losing 1,000 people a month in 2013 to 500 people a month in 2014. Our numbers are looking like we're losing 250 a month here. We're getting close to the day when we're going to reverse that 60-year trend and the population of Detroit is going to grow. So, <clears throat> all right. so I, I want to stop and say thank you. Uh, to the governor and the legislators for a major success that happened last December. In December, the legislature adopted these two bills. John Walsh, a Republican, Phil Cavanaugh, a Democrat from Detroit. We were facing a huge foreclosure crisis. There were a lot of properties being foreclosed, but most of them were vacant houses. But we had 18,000 homes that were being foreclosed on where there was a homestead exemption, which means the owner owned the house, the family was living in the house, it was going to be foreclosed on, 18,000. What were we going to do? I sat with the governor in, on West Hunter Drive. I showed him the problem. I said, the problem we have today is that under state law, if the treasurer wants to work out any payment plan, he's got to charge people 18% interest. You're not doing them any favors. So now the city's coming back. People want to stay. They can't afford to pay 18%. We'd like to be able to spread the payments over four years and charge 6%. Governor said, I'll support you. 
I give so much credit to the Republic, the, the, the representatives and the, the senators from the city of Detroit who fought for this for a long time. We got the bill through the Senate, got to be the last day before session closed, before Christmas. And you remember everybody in Lansing was totally consumed by the road package, all anybody was talking about. And the bill had gotten through Senate committee and it was about to die. And I needed to vote in the Senate floor. And I went to see the Senate floor leader, Arlen Mikoff. I said, Senator, I need your help. I need you to do this vote. He says, you want to talk about roads? I said, no, no, I want to talk about foreclosures. He says, foreclosures? I said, yeah, we got this bill. It's all the way through. I just need you to schedule a vote. And Senator Mikoff represents Olive Township. Now, if you haven't heard of it, it's west of Grand Rapids. He's a Republican. I guarantee you foreclosure was not on his mind that day. But when he heard the story, he says, Mike, I'm not sure how I'm going to do it, but I will get you a vote on the Senate floor before we adjourn. And he did, and it passed the Senate. And this week, Treasurer Wayberg Tolwich tells me of those 18,000 families, 14,000 have signed agreements. The foreclosure has been stopped. Those families are going to be staying in their homes. So think about that, 14,000 homes. If there's an average of three people in these single family houses, 42,000 people. That's the population of the city of Midland. A bipartisan agreement that we put through without controversy essentially kept the equivalent of the city of Midland staying in their homes in the city of Detroit. It's the kind of partnerships that we need more of. And so we've now gone back and updated our analysis. Uh, the Blight Task Force says there were 84,000 houses. They weren't all vacant, but they were showing signs of blight. We aren't sure if they're going to have to be demolished. We went through in this last month, and we now have got a final analysis. We still have 40,000 houses. Now, 40,000 is a lot, but it isn't 84,000. And next year, I hope we stand here and have it be 30,000. We've got a long way to go in this city, but we're making some progress. The uh, fight to keep the population turns as much on anything as uh, what's going on in the Detroit public schools. And I haven't gotten deeply into this issue. I have some political staff who point out to me that Mayor Adrian Fenty in Washington, D.C. was popular and got defeated in re-election because he got into the schools issue. We all saw Rahm Emanuel nearly got beat in Chicago because he got invested in the schools issue. They're like, Mike, uh, do we really need to do schools this year? <laughs> and yet, there's a point at which you can't keep watching what's happened to the future of our kids. And so I want to talk about what's going on. So you're hearing the talk. The, the Education uh, Coalition, Tanya Allen and Dave Hecker and John Recolt and Angela uh, Reyes and uh, Reverend Wendell Anthony, the work that they did was phenomenal. The governor has put forward another serious proposal. How many people understand this? How many people understand the difference between the Education Coalition proposal, the governor's proposal, and what's going on in this issue? OK, in about 20, 20, there's two hands in the room. Uh, even Tanya, Tanya is the second one, all right. Uh, in 20 minutes, I think you're going to understand the issues better, but I'm just going to talk to you about my perspective. We have people working in good faith, but we got to get this done. So let me tell you about this. There are basically three issues. One, there's $500 million of operating debt at the Detroit Public Schools. How do we handle it? Question one. Two. How does the DPS governance structure work? We've had an emergency manager instead of the school board, and the enrollments decline steadily. How do we run the Detroit schools in a way that people have confidence to come back to the system? And third, and in my mind, the single most important question, how do we coordinate the chaos of the 100 charter schools and the public schools so the kids start to learn in the classroom? Those are the three things. If we can deal with the debt, we can deal with who runs DPS, and we put in a system where kids learn in the classroom, we can address the problem. And those are the three issues that this boils down to. So here's Governor Snyder's proposal for dealing with the $500 million in operating debt. Uh, and what he is proposing is that you take the debt and put it in an old corporation, kind of a bankruptcy form, uh, that you call uh, Old Co. Uh, and here's what you do. You take 18 mils away of the air being levied by the city or by the schools, paid by the city, and you take another 50 to $70 million in state funds and you pay that off. And then you run the system out of NUCO. And the question the legislature is asking is, why is the state going to have to pay off 50 to $70 million a year uh, for the Detroit public schools? 
And that's the debate that is a good question that we're going to ask. And what we have to do in order to talk about it is talk about the recent history of emergency management at the Detroit Public Schools. And I feel like I've been watching this train wreck, and I could see it coming. It is so similar to what I dealt with when I went into the DMC. When I became the CEO of the Detroit Medical Center in the eight hospitals in 2004, DMC had lost $100 million a year for five years. And when I was hired, I had been the prosecutor, they were ready to, to close three hospitals and lay off 2,000 people to balance the budget. And I came in and said, wait a minute. Healthcare is a business that depends on long-term relationships. Your relationship with your doctor is a long-term relationship. The doctor's relationship with the hospital is a long-term relationship. If we're always cutting and laying off, how are we ever going to succeed? And my first order of business was I stopped the hospital closings, I stopped the layoffs, and we changed the service level. We took the emergency room from three hours to 29 minutes. We recruited cardiologists. The time I spent at DMC, I spent 70% of my time building our customer base, our patient base, and 30% managing finances. The problem is the point at which Jennifer Granholm appointed the emergency manager in 2009 with Robert Bob. You said to the people of the city of Detroit, the schools are in a state of emergency, Robert Bob is running them. But think about schools. It's a long-term relationship. You send your kid to a high school, that kid's there for the next four years. You want to go to a K-8 school, you're committing your child for the next nine years. And so she appointed Robert Bob. He had a deficit of $200 million. And he promptly closed 30 schools and announced, with what I've done, we will have a $17 million surplus in 2010. Because he cut the expenses. He knew how many students he had, right? It's going to be a surplus. And I watched this, and I said, I can't believe what I'm seeing. So what happened? In 2010, the deficit had grown to $270 million. People left the system. And so he announced he was going to close 26 more schools this time. It will be balanced. And in 2011, the deficit had grown to $363 million. Now, in fairness to Robert Bob, under this statute, he did not have the authority to run the curriculum. He couldn't address the education in the classroom. And so when people from Detroit were just being told, cut and close, they all left. So he said in February 2011, I'm going to close 70 more schools, and he announced he was increasing class sizes to 60. And newly elected Governor Snyder removed him. And they changed the law. And the new law gave the new emergency manager, Roy Roberts, the authority to handle the curriculum. And Roy Roberts, who I work with closely, did as fine a job as any human being could do in saying to the public, here are the improvements I'm going to make to the schools. We're going to improve education. Come on back. Except that if you're committing to a school for four years or eight years, and the emergency manager's there for one year, it didn't much matter. Roy Roberts succeeded in slowing the decline. People just left at a reduced rate. And so what you have seen here is three different emergency managers, every one of them, outstanding people, highly qualified executives. And all that's happened is the deficit has grown and people have left. We have to give people a quality education if we're going to reverse the trend. So uh, <laughs> the enrollment in the city has been down from the time Robert Bob went in dropped every single year, now to 47,000. Now, it was dropping before they got here. It was dropping under the old system. It took 10 years to lose half the enrollment before we appointed this emergency manager. Now we lost half the enrollment in five years. OK? It's not solving the problem. And so what does it have, what effect does it have in the classroom? So this is Darnell Early, who's doing a great job as the emergency manager. He just put out a cash flow. Now, I know it's going to sound boring, but if you pay attention, it's going to shock you. This is this year's cash flow. He's going to spend $268 million in payroll. All the teachers, all the staff, everybody this year, $268 million. This year, he's going to spend $32 million paying off the debt from 2011. That's not the whole debt. That's what he's paying out this year. And $21 million from 2012, and $41 million from 2013, and $67 million. They're going to pay out $161 million in cash. And I saw Darnell earlier. I said, there's got to be a typo. He said, it's not. He said, that debt wasn't run up in the last four years. It was run up over 15 years. But yeah, 
So think about what that says. You're spending $268 million if you pay your teachers and your salaries, and $161 million out the door in debt. These children need more teaching, more support, more music, more art, lower class sizes, and instead, this is going out the door. And the state of Michigan sold those bonds and guaranteed those bonds. And so the governor has got to figure out what he's going to do. Because whether you think it's right or wrong, the fact is the state guaranteed all of those funds. And so the governor says, OK, there are legal obligations. Uh, it was guaranteed by us. Well, then some say, well, OK, why, why can't we kick the can down the road that's been going on for a long time? Why do we need to deal with it now? Here's why the governor's pushing it now. If you look at what's happening at the DPS credit rating, credit rating has been downgraded five times in six years. Twice in 2009, and then in 13, and then again in 14, and then again just a couple of months ago. This is the numbers that look just like the city of Detroit before it went into bankruptcy. That's the direction this is heading. And so if you're the state of Michigan, you have a choice. Do I wait until we run out of cash and go into bankruptcy, and the state's on the hook for everything? Or do I figure out how we manage this obligation in a way that's reasonable? And so when the governor put forward old co and new co, he's saying it's better financial management to deal with this rationally. Now, I don't know if the payment for um, this should come from the school aid fund or from another source, but I think everybody here should agree that we can't have this money being taken out of the children of the city of Detroit. They didn't do anything wrong. Everybody should be behind Rick Snyder's old code, new code solution. It's the right answer. The second issue is an area where I disagree with the governor. And we've reached the point where we can have conversations where there's no name call or anything. We just talk about why we disagree. And I hope after this he changes his mind. But let me pitch. <laughs> so we have two choices. The governor said, who runs DPS? Governor says, we're going to have a new board, four appointed by the governor, three appointed by the mayor. I wish he had given me a phone call before he announced he was having me appoint them. That wasn't a big surprise, a good surprise to me. But he says, but we'll elect two of them in 17 and two of them in 19 and three of them in 21, and then we'll take over. The Education Coalition says we should immediately return it to the elected school board. I'm going to suggest in this one a compromise is the right way to go, and I'll tell you why I feel that way. Is there any reason to believe that continued state control will bring students back to DPS? I mean, 95 public schools have closed since 2009. 40,000 students are left. You can say, yeah, the state has the money. We should control it. But if your customers are choosing to go someplace else, you're going to have a bigger deficit. We're going to be standing here in two years with not 47,000 kids, but 37,000 and a $100 million deficit and say, gee, how did that happen? It isn't going to work, and I think at times Lansing doesn't really understand Detroit, but I think this is pretty predictable. I'll tell you the second part. The governor's plan is that he appoints four, the mayor appoints three, but we elect two new people in 2017. Okay, that's the starting point. I can tell you something about city of Detroit politics. As you are enrolling your kids in the fall of 2016, every candidate for these school boards will be pledging to unseat the governor's majority and have local control. I promise you, that will be the campaign. As the city council member said, of course. So think about this. If you, I want you to think about each of you in your own individual school districts. If you had to decide next year to put your kid in a high school or in a grade school for several years, and you knew that while well, the governor had control today, everybody was, was going to try and change that, let me see with a show of hands. If you had another choice, who would put your kids in that system? Right? You can raise your hands. It's OK. Right? Nobody. Detroiters aren't any different. And so this structure is going to cause people not to enroll in the schools, which is why I think it's a mistake. On the other hand, the governor says, OK, but one of the problems is the current elected board were elected when there was no uh, authority for them. A lot of people didn't run. Nobody was paying attention. They weren't truly elected with the expectation to run the city. And he says, if the state's going to assume the operating debt, we got to have some ability to make sure it's not run up again. Those are two pretty legitimate points that I think we've got to address. 
And so my suggestion would be this. We need to hold the school board election. If we can't do it this fall, next spring. Let's have an election. Let's elect a school board in this city that's going to lead this city forward. If you were to announce that now, you would get the best and brightest in the city of Detroit. The community would be behind the campaign. You would elect a new board that they could have confidence in. And then the question is, well, how does the state know the new board's not going to run up a deficit? We've got a precedent. Let's have a financial review board. If you followed this, as part of the grand bargain, I report and city council reports to a state appointed financial review board. I go to a monthly meeting. They got to sign off on my budget. Any contract over 750,000, any labor agreement, they have to sign off on that today. It was passed. The city of Detroit financial review board was passed by the state legislature 103 to 7 in the house and 36 to 2 in the senate. There's bipartisan precedent. Let's have the newly elected school board report to a state appointed board and I think we can get the balance. The last piece to me is the single most important issue, and it's the thing that's being talked about a lot. How do these kids learn in the classroom? We have a system right now with 119,000 kids, 47,000 in public schools, 38,000 in charters, large number going outside the city, 200 schools today, half public, half charter, and there are 12 different authorizers with no control. Anybody of these 12 can authorize a school anywhere they want, anytime they want. No coordination. So what does that mean in the city of Detroit? You want to talk about chaos. We have had 164 schools opened and closed in the city in the last six years. So you look at this. 2009, DPS opened 10, closed 30, charter opened 5. 2010, DPS closed 26, charter open five. You look at what's happening year by year. In the last six years, 95 closed, 41 charters open. There's only 200 schools in the city, 164 open and closed. I want each of you to think about your own individual school district. If the place where your child is going in your home community had three quarters of your schools open and closed in the last six years, how would you feel about your education system? But that's what we're subjected to because there's no central authorizing authority. So here are the results, and they're pretty graphic in the chaos because there's no central control. Here is the west side of Detroit. We got 3,700 high school kids, three high schools. There's a 15 square mile area in Brightmore that has no high schools. But if you're in greater downtown, only a couple thousand kids, we got 11 high schools for you. Okay, well, you're really well covered. But if you're on the east side with 6,000 kids, we only have two. How many of you live in cities that would ever tolerate this? But this is what is happening from the lack of control. And what has happened in our classrooms? Our children, only 4%. Imagine this. 96 kids out of 100 by fourth grade. They're nine years old. And they're behind. Not only is it the worst in America, most of the big cities are at 30 or 40%. The next lowest is Cleveland. At 13, we're not even, we're not just the bottom, we're all the way off the bottom. And with this kind of chaos, it's not any surprise. Math isn't any better. And here's the thing, the charters were supposed to be the saviors. Half the charters are doing no better than the worst performing public school system in America. And a number of these failing charters are opening more schools because there's no central authority. This is what we are allowing to happen. So here's what the coalition said. They said, seven member board appointed by the mayor. This was not an easy thing for me to go in and say I'd be willing to do. Uh, because um, uh, this is going to uh, end uh, the really good approval ratings I have right now. Um, <laughs> but at some point, how many times can you look at these young little kids and say, you don't have a future because of the zip code you were born into? So I sat with this coalition. Here's the thing, this commission is not going to operate any schools. I do not want any part of operating schools. The public school board needs to operate theirs. The charter school board needs to operate theirs. We're not going to operate schools. We're not going to hire principals. We're not going to hire teachers. We're not going to tell you what your curriculum is. But what we are going to do is establish order. I consider it like a commission, a commissioner of baseball, who doesn't tell you, sign Max Scherzer, fire Brad Osmus, but make sure everybody has an equal and fair process. So we want to bring order to the opening and closing of schools. We want to expand quality schools. And here's the central principle. 
charter and public schools have to be treated equally. They should be absolutely valued equally. They should be supported based only upon whether there's quality of your school. Anybody who thinks the parents of Detroit are somehow defending a status quo have not been there. Parents in Detroit want choice. They just want good quality schools to choose from. And so I think this is what we ought to do as this commission. We ought to demand there be a single standard and fair competition. So what will the DEC do? If you want to open a school in the city of Detroit, you're going to have to come and get permission. We had seven schools open in southwest Detroit in one year. It destabilized every school that was already there. You need to come in and say, this area is geographically underserved, or we don't have this kind of curriculum. You make your case. If we have an area like Brightmoor that's underserved, we'll go out for bids. We say, we're going to put a new high school here. We'll let the charters and the public compete. We'll do it rationally. We need to have a central transportation system, right? 30% of our kids are in households that don't have a car, which means you get the public school next to your house and you're out of luck, because most charters are not providing buses. We've got to provide some transportation so these kids really have choices. Let's give parents a report card so they can do it. Let's provide a common enrollment system so you can say a cornerstone of charter school is my, my first choice, uh, but Chrysler Elementary, the public school that just won the chess national championship is my second choice, but put them in order in a single common enrollment process. Let's go get the national philanthropic money. The Gates Foundation money isn't coming here because who in the world would they give it to now, right? Okay, but if the DEC is there, we could seek money for extra teaching, uh, extra service for principal academies and teachers, after school programs, and we provide it to the charters and the public together. And we could coordinate workforce development strategies. And here's the key thing. We've got to have the ability to close failing schools on an objective basis. So, if this were to pass, what I would envision is in the spring, we would put out performance measures to every school. You'd be evaluated on test scores, but also your enrollment trends, your student attendance, the employee turnover, parent satisfaction, the whole picture of a school. In 2016, we're going to measure you against that in every quarter, put out a report so everybody knows exactly where your school stands and what they need to do. In 2017, we're going to say to the schools that were below the targets, Here's what you need to do to improve. And we're going to bring you resources. We're going to give you money for extra teacher training, extra principal training, extra school activities. We'll give you some options. But if you haven't made progress in the fall of 18, we need to close the school. That, to me, is a fair and rational process that we are prepared to, re to lead at the local level. So if we started now, we could have the DEC in place by the end of the year. By this spring, think about what you could have. You could have students attending school fairs. You could have a bunch of high schools all lined up together. And because the kids have transportation options, they could go to a fair and have four or five high schools pitch them, come to my school, let them make informed choices, we'll give them decisions. Wouldn't it be something if children in our Detroit had those kind of schools? We'll give them the evaluation, and we could start fall of 16, we're ready to go. And so this was not an easy conversation. If you had seen the people in the room who had to say, I don't know about this. This Education Commission, they're going to be able to provide transportation. There are some charter schools who really don't want transportation coming from the poor areas to their areas. And it's just the truth. Uh, you're going to have the power to close schools. And so who went along with this? This coalition that recommended everything I just said, John Ricold, the very conservative Republican from Walbridge, Mark Royce, the Vice President of General Motors, these people spent hundreds of hours in meetings on this stuff. Sandy Barua, President of the Chamber, had the courage to step in and say, We've got to do this. Also, Dave Hecker, the president of the Michigan Federation of Teachers. Imagine this. I said to Dave Hecker, if we do this, we're going to treat the charters the same as the public schools. If you're going to represent the Detroit Teachers Union, you're going to have to compete. He said, I'll sign up to compete. Who would have thought it? Right? Jimmy Settles from the UAW, Steve Hamp, one of the pioneers of charter schools, Clark Durant, another charter school operator, they all said, we're willing to sign up to do this now. And so. I'm hoping that as we have this conversation, we say, and this is what I believe, and I, I think we're going to get to a solution, because I think there's people of good faith uh, on all sides. Let's support the governor's old co, new co plan. Let's elect a new school board and put in a state oversight board. And let's move on the DEC so we can hold these kids, we can hold the schools accountable. I know this is the children of Detroit. 
But the truth of the matter is this, and Sandy Barua says this all the time, we're becoming a community where if you're born rich, you die rich, and if you're born poor, you die poor. The key to changing that is this, and the only way this is gonna happen, if people outside Detroit join in on this mission, we're gonna get this done if the folks in this room decide they're not Detroit's kids, they're everybody's kids. Thank you very much. Please welcome the senior producer and host of Michigan Matters and columnist for the Detroit Free Press, Carol Kane. All right. All right. Sorry, Mr. Jeff. I was gonna happen. How are you doing? Well, Mr. Mayor, there was a nice report card and everything going on from last year, uh, and everybody is worth plotting for all the wonderful things that have taken place. So as we start here with the questions, um, you're 18 months into your job. It has changed dramatically, as so many people in the room can experience themselves. Your job has changed dramatically. So uh, is the, how's the job going, and is it what you expected? Uh, you know, uh, it, people have been absolutely wonderful. Uh, you know, we've, I think we've got the management team in place we want, the number of folks in the business community that have come forward. Uh, it just seems like every day uh, we're announcing a renovation of an abandoned uh, recreation center into a new restaurant and community center, the expansion of the Sakti Manufacturing Center in southwest Detroit, the building of the new neighborhood in Brush Park. Um, People have just been wonderfully supportive. The president's been supportive. Uh, the state of Michigan's been supportive. Uh, and I really couldn't have asked for any more uh, than what I've had. When you look at all the issues, you outlined a variety of topics here and things you've been working on the last year. What rises to the top to you as the number one challenge that you're facing as mayor? Well, I would say the schools. And the second issue has got to be de-insurance. We've got to get these car insurance rates down. And I'm hoping uh, we're about, we got a bill pending before the Senate Insurance Committee. Uh, it's up for vote next week. Uh, the chairman, Joe Hewn, I think is committed uh, to, uh, to getting this done. Uh, but I really do believe we can cut the car insurance rates by $1,000 a person in Detroit uh, by next year. And that's what we're going to do. So when it comes... <laughs> a Detroit resident you, you applauding tell, out there. You can tell who's from Detroit. <laughs> yeah. the, rest, the rest of you don't understand. But <laughs> I've said this before. My car insurance went from $3,000 to $6,000 when I moved into the city. It is astonishing uh, the way uh, Detroiters are paying for insurance. With the plan that you've outlined here, on average, how much will people be saving and realistically to try to get this through Lansing? Uh, what's it going to take? I, you know, I think we're going to get it through. Um, so you had a fascinating thing. Most of the insurance industry is supporting us. And at this Senate hearing, I testified, followed by representatives of the NAACP and the UAW, all testifying for auto insurance reform. And, and the legislators never thought they'd see the insurance industry, the UAW, the NAACP, and the mayor of Detroit all on the same proposal. So I think, uh, uh, I'm not telling you that there aren't places where they're going to play defense on us, but I think we're going to get it done. Yeah. Everybody knows that you are a car guy. You love to drive. You drive yourself. I read the story with interest about your police chief, James Craig, saying he wouldn't stop overnight somewhere to fill up his car. So since you drive yourself, you have any concern about stopping at a gas station yeah. at night? You know, everybody is, is conscious. But, you know, I've been in this, in this situation where you say something that gets interpreted in a way that you didn't mean. There's no way Chief Craig meant to say that. Uh, but, it, you know, if you're going to hold us to, to the interpretation of everything we say, uh, you can do gotcha all the time. Uh, but I think everybody in Detroit is conscious, whether you're filling up gas, day or night, it's prudent. And I got to tell you, there's a whole lot of suburbs where you ought to be conscious uh, when you're filling up gas. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone who has been coming to this conference for years knows that schools, Detroit Public Schools, has been near and dear to you for a long time. I remember years ago when you single-handedly stood up here long before you were right. mayor or, and, and asked all the corporations here to adopt schools in Detroit to help fix them up. They needed, they were in many disarray, needed paintings and so forth, and you did that. So on the heels of the conversation this morning with John Rocolta, Tanya Allen, talking about what's going on at DPS, so many people are asking, Mr. Mayor, why don't you take over Detroit Public Schools? You know, if I thought I could manage the schools and make them better, I would say so. But I'm trying to be honest about our management capacity. If you look at what we've got to do, this city is still too violent. I'm spending a lot of time with Chief Craig. We're building up the management team in the police department. The buses still are not running uh, the way that I want them to. We're spending a lot of time there. We got to bring jobs into the city. 
our management team is working 18 hours a day to run the systems that we've got. So I don't believe to try to run 100 schools and every time a teacher hits a student with a broom, everything in the administration stops because that's a, a very serious issue in the city, we couldn't function. And so I tried to find the right balance. And in the conversation with the Education Commission, I said, you know what, I think an elected school board is the right thing to do. I think having a state oversight board is the right thing to do. And so I don't see us getting involved in the running of the schools, but we absolutely have the capacity to run an education commission to make sure every school operates on a fair and level playing field. And so it seemed like to me that was the right balance. There's going to be a lot more conversations taking place. The governor has his plan for DPS. The coalition has his plan for DPS. The state's going to be involved. The governor's involved. You're involved. Have you had conversations with the governor specifically about his plan and maybe figure out a way to blend sure. what there is? And what have those conversations they, they, You know, they're, they're all constructive. And of course, Tanya Allen and the Education Coalition has had a number of meetings with the governor uh, as well. They, I, these, there are people of goodwill on all sides uh, who are trying to do uh, the right thing. Uh, and I'm optimistic. Uh, that we're going to get there. It's a different tone. We can disagree now without calling each other names. We can actually have an exchange of ideas. Uh, and, and I'm confident between the Education Coalition, the governor, the legislative leaders uh, in my administration, we're going to get to a good solution. So you've had many conversations with the governor. How do you describe your relationship with the governor, if you had to put a few words on it? We get along a lot better since Kevin Orr's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, really? You want to explain a little bit yeah, more? No, I mean, that's, you know. Okay. I, 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 I never agreed with the appointment of the emergency manager, but that's behind us. You know. Yeah. Well, speaking of Kevin Orr, when he left, he left a cleaner balance sheet behind. And what are you doing to ensure that the city doesn't fall back into fiscal peril and maybe get to the point where Oakland County, which has a three year budget, looking, being able to do that? Um, do you anticipate that at some point? Well, we have a four year budget that was just approved by the Financial Review Commission last month. Um, and so we are in fiscal year 2014 2015 that ends June 30th, about five weeks from now. Uh, and I can tell you uh, that we are running ahead of uh, budget on revenue, under budget on expenses, and we are going to finish 2015 with a balanced operating budget for the first time since 2002. There's, there's a lot of conversation up here about the Great Lakes Water Authority and conversation whether it gets off the ground in July as uh, people have been saying it should be getting off there. What does Mayor Mike Duggan have to say about it? I have to say that I'm under a uh, federal gag order and I can't talk about it. But uh, Mark Hackle did, so yeah, I know he's not as afraid of the federal judge as I am. <laughs> uh, so there, there are. There's, we're trying to do something historic here, and if you look at the issues, the complexity of these legal issues uh, are enormous. Uh, but. Uh, I'm optimistic we're going to get them resolved, uh, and I am now starting to understand bond guarantees on water revenue bonds and who's in first position and second position and third position, something I was never much interested in before, but ultimately it's going to either solve or not solve this problem. But I'm optimistic we're going to find a solution. We got, I think, till June 14th to approve the lease, so you're going to find out what? soon enough whether we solve it. You made an interesting decision to transfer land to Maddie Maroon uh, that allows for a second Canadian bridge crossing. He obviously is having trouble getting the land on the other side, of, which makes his project a little bit iffy. So why, you see the need for two Canadian bridges, obviously. So I would say this. Number one, I think we need two crossings. Uh, and and the, the Ambassador Bridge is, I don't know, 75, 80 years old. Uh, and and uh, I think pretty much everybody agrees from a security and economic development standpoint, we need two crossings. So the Maroons came and said, we've got Riverside Park. If you've seen it, it is not a quality park. Uh, and they said, we want land adjacent to the bridge, which runs right over Riverside Park. I said, you know what? You've got five acres that are beautiful on the water that are at the other end of the park. And uh, I'd like you to put $3 million immediately in to build out the park so we can have a soccer field and baseball field and fishing and parks, et cetera. Uh, and, by the way, nothing pisses me off more than those vacant windows in the train station. Uh, and so I want you to agree to replace all those windows by the end of the year. And if you do all that, 
I'm willing to sell you the, the, the three acres under the bridge for another $2 million. And he says, but uh, what happens if I don't get Canadian approval? And I said, you know, that's between you and the Canadians. Uh, but I want the, the, the thousand windows in now. I want the five acres now. I want the $3 million to fix the park now. And they said, OK. Uh, and so they look at it as a little different. They're looking at 10 and 20 year windows. And the Canadian government doesn't appear to have any interest in letting them put the bridge on their side today. But to pick up three acres and be in a position 10 years from now to be able to say, hey, we've got to replace this old bridge, this old span, uh, is, is that what they're doing? I don't know. But from my standpoint, I think it's a very good agreement. Uh, and I got a feeling when the people of this town see the windows going in that train station, we're another step toward the redevelopment. And I'm going to grind away at this until we get uh, developers in who start to develop that train station of Florida time. This whole conference has, as one of the conversations, inclusion, trying to get more people involved in, in many different ways here, including things going on in the city of Detroit and uh, economic development and so forth. I had an interesting conversation with Charlie Beckham, who works with you and helps in the neighborhoods. He's worked for the last six uh, governor or mayors of the city of Detroit. Oh, he comes with the office. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you did bring him out of retirement yeah. to bring come back and work with you. But anyway. Yeah. He was, in this whole thing about that, that African Americans are not being involved and included in, in things going on in Detroit, and it's a have and have nots, it's a black and white division. How do you see it? He explained to me, he said that out of all the mayors he's worked with, not since Coleman Young has he seen somebody so making sure of inclusion, and it doesn't really get much attention. So talk a little bit about that. You, you know, this, I am very lucky to be mayor of Detroit at this time. And I know people say, what are you talking about? Uh, but I am, because you know, I, I came to work in the city in 1981 thinking I was going to be part of a, a group of young people to rebuild the city. And nobody my age followed me in the 80s. Uh, now, the, these young people want to live in urban centers. They're pouring into urban centers across the country and into Detroit at rates I never thought that I would see. And Dan Gilbert has certainly sped up uh, the, the redevelopment, but a lot of other people have uh, as, as well. And so the question is now, as these opportunities present in a way we haven't seen in a long time, how do we make sure that the long-time Detroiters participate as well? And so if you go to the Detroit Opportunity website on our webpage, what will you see? If you've been in the city, you can get a 0% loan to fix up your house so you can benefit from the property values that are growing. If you want to start your own business, we've got the Motor City Match competition that's going to give out $500,000 every quarter to new business startups. We're giving priority to people who are opening businesses in the neighborhoods. So we're, so we're participating in that way. We get up every morning and say, how do we make sure that the folks who have been here are going to participate fairly in this? Uh, and. Uh, you know, there are great opportunities here. I think uh, I feel really good about the fact we want everybody to stay. The key to this is everybody's got to participate. We don't have anybody to waste. So when you read the stories in the papers and hear the reports on TV and on the web and so forth about the fact that African Americans are not getting as much consideration as they should, what do you say about those stories? Again, I, I, I got to tell you, if you look at those kinds of stories today as opposed to three years ago or five years ago, I actually think uh, they're much less. But I'm not somebody who's much bothered by criticism. Uh, you look at the direction and what's happening, I think people uh, are, are feeling uh, very good uh, about the opportunities. But uh, we're going to see as we go forward, project after project that we announce, uh, you are seeing African American participation. Uh, and, uh, and that's the way it should be. So I can't have you here and not ask you a political question. 2018 is just around the corner, right after the 2016 presidential campaign that's already being discussed. Um, anything you want to announce about the governor? I, I will be very clear, and I've got to tell you, I'm just tired of listening to it. I will not be a candidate for governor in 2018. And I've said it to you and the members of the media. Leave me out of your stories. Leave me out of your polls. Leave me out of your speculation. <laughs> I never would have left DMC to run for governor. It does not look like a fun job. I am going to stay mayor of Detroit if the people of the city want me. I will not be a candidate for governor. Please don't ask me again. Okay. I 
I'll assume that's a no. I'll take that as a very... <laughs> so, a year from now, when we come back here, what do you hope to be able to announce that, that has changed and improved here? You, you, can see, uh, you can see what we're doing, but I'm hoping we're going to have dozens of new businesses started through Motor City Match. Uh, I'm hoping this year we had 25 neighborhoods that grew in property values, which is remarkable. I hope next year it's 50 neighborhoods uh, that grew in property values. Uh, and I hope uh, that I'm here talking about what the Detroit Education Commission is doing to improve the schools. You can. Yeah. <laughs> So you're convinced that this will get resolved in the next year? Uh, you know, there are people of goodwill on all sides. These are tough issues, but uh, I got to tell you, the tone of this is everybody's trying to find a solution. And I can't say enough about Tanya Allen uh, and all the folks on her team. We wouldn't be anywhere if it weren't for them. And so, Tanya, thank you. Well, Mr. Mayor, we want to thank you for taking time to share with us, give us an update on things, very optimistic, some great things going on, a lot of challenges still ahead, particularly in education, but thank you so much and for joining us. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, sir.